Our second scripture reading comes from Romans 5, 1 through 8. By faith we have been made acceptable to God, and now because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. Christ has also introduced us to God's undeserved kindness on which we take our stand. So we are happy as we look forward to sharing in the glory of God, but that's not all. We gladly suffer because we know that suffering helps us to endure. And endurance builds character, which gives us a hope that we will never disappoint us. All of this happens because God has given us the Holy Spirit, who fills our hearts with his love. Christ died for us at a time when we were helpless and sinful. No one is really willing to die for an honest person, though someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. But God showed how much he loved us by saving Christ, by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for the opportunity to come together as your people, to hear your word, to be blessed by you, and to offer blessing back to you. Lord, as we enter this time, uh, we, we seek listening for your word, and I ask that either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Father's Day once again. Today is a day for celebrating dads, and what better way to do that than to look at the one who is ultimate father. God is a good, good father. Molly shared that earlier this week as some of the youth were sharing songs back and forth on on Group Me. It's a a contemporary Christian song right now that says, um, God is a good, good father. Uh, But... When we think of Father's Day as well, for some of us, um, if you had a wonderful dad, it's a great feeling, but maybe your experience of dad wasn't necessarily the best, or some kids growing up where they do not have a father figure in their life, so their father figure is mom, who is stepping up and being both mom and dad in those situations, just as we've had dads who have had to step up and be both mom and dad's for their kids. So where does God fit into the midst of all of this? Because God still is a good, good father. And uh, we're watching the young adults this past week. We watched the movie The Shack. And uh, one of the images in that, when the gentleman actually meets God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he encounters uh, a woman as God, and he's Dumb, dumbstruck from that and doesn't know how to understand that or how to uh, figure out how is God a woman? What's, what's going on? You know, it's, he had these images from stained glass of the man and the white beard and everything. And this gentleman had been through a lot. He had some tortured experiences in his family and he was really struggling uh, with his relationship with God and just being able to get past everything that he had been through. And the woman representing God said, with everything you've been through and all your hurting and everything that you're feeling right now, I figured that you needed a God more like a mother during this time at this moment. Uh, And was thinking about that and pondering on that, that God is a good, good father, and God is a great, great God, and God will be who we need God to be in the times that we need God to be. And that gave me a lot of hope and a lot of peace in that time and a lot of ways to understand how God is. So today we're talking about how God is a good, good God. If we look at the scriptures from today, we see that the psalmist Many believe King David writing that psalm, talking about how God delivered him from a very difficult situation and offering his response of praise, that he would lift up God in the sanctuary among all the people. 
that would he, he would lift out the cup of salvation, and that he would keep the promises that he made before God as a result. It's God being a good, good God of delivering David through a difficult time. And we get that. You know, you think of King David, king of Jerusalem, king of all the Jewish people, good God. God had set him, good guy, God had set him aside, anointed him to be king. But how about the rest of us? And that's where our scripture from Romans comes in. And Paul talks about how that good, good God who even saved King David also comes into our lives. What does the epistle say? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in our sin, while we were broken and everything else, God's love was available to us. God's grace was sufficient for us. And that God was willing to offer salvation even to us. So... You don't have to be King David. You don't have to have been anointed by God for something. God's grace is sufficient and available to all. And that begins our answering of the question, what makes God good? God's love is the first piece of what makes God good. God created us in Genesis. And what did God say at the end of that creation? That it was very, very good. God's love is there because God chose for us to come into existence. God chose us to be in relationship with. God's love is available for every single one of us because God created us. In the movie The Shack, you'll, you'll hear, if you get a chance to see it, it's a really wonderful movie. Even if you didn't like the book, I encourage you to check out the movie. Uh, I think it's wonderful. I think it has a very high Christology and something to be gained. But God kept saying throughout it, I'm especially fond of you. <laughs> and talking about all these, every time someone was brought up, I'm especially fond of that person. So when you think of God's love, thinking of God looking at each person, even people that you would think that God would not like very much, God saying, I'm especially fond of that person. And why is that? Because God created us. Do we always make God happy? No. Do we make mistakes and hurt God's feelings sometimes? Yes. But does God continue to love us? Yes. What a lesson for us as parents to remember with our children. You know, how many of us feel that way? Sometimes our children frustrate us and upset us, but do we stop loving them? No. And where do we learn that from? God's love. The other way we know that uh, God is good is God's salvation through Jesus Christ. God offers us his grace and his salvation while we are yet sinners. Amazing. How do we deserve that? You know? In our economy and the way we think of things, the only time that we deserve anything like that, for someone to make a sacrifice for us, for someone to offer us salvation and forgiveness and everything else, we should have had to have done something amazing. We should have had to have done something really good. We should have stepped up to the plate. But this message is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, for our salvation, without us having done anything necessary to receive that without us having done anything that would warrant that Jesus on the cross seeing everything going on even reaches down in prayer and says father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing what a powerful message that is for all of us what a powerful message of God's grace for each of us that God thinks so much of us that God is so especially fond of us, that God loves us so much, that it wasn't about what we did, but it was what God was going to do for us anyway, because we're his children. What a good God. So how do we respond? If we look at the psalm, we respond by giving thanks. We respond by doing well with our lives and our faith, and we learn and grow 
from the difficulties that we face at times in our life. So the other piece that reminds us that God is a good, good God is the grace that God offers. Christ dying on the cross for us while we were yet sinners, it was unmerited, it was undeserved. But where did it come from? One of the things wonderful about us in our United Methodist heritage is having a very strong theology on grace that John Wesley gave to us. Bless you. Does anybody know the three levels of grace that we have in the Methodist church? Do I have a confirmand in the room? Sanctifying is one of them. What's the other? Oh, my goodness. You're going back to confirmation. It's a repeatable right. Okay, so what are they? We have sanctifying grace. What else? Prevenient grace. And we have... Oh, my goodness. What is it? Thank you, justification. So, there's three levels of grace that John Wesley taught us. The first is prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is God's love for us before we even know God. It's available to us just because we are. It has nothing for us to do to receive it, to earn it, or anything else. It's God's prevenient grace for us because God made us, therefore God loves us, and God's love is there for us even before we come to know God. Pretty cool, huh? That covers a lot of people, doesn't it? You know, so when you're worried that someone is beyond God's love and grace, don't be. God loves us because God created us, and therefore that love is available. We may not know it yet, and that carries its own burden and weight with us. Okay, that just being separated from God in life is its own punishment because it keeps us from being the fullness of who God created us to be, but it doesn't mean that we're outside of God's love and grace. So then we have justifying grace. Justifying grace is that aha moment. It's that moment that we come to realize, oh, wait a minute, wow, there is a God. Wow, there's a God, and God loves me, and God's willing to forgive me, and God's willing to take me in, and God's willing to receive me. That's the moment that we're justified in that grace and that love of God. And then from that point forward, what did Jesus promise all people beyond the time that they came into salvation through Christ? The gift of the... Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we are sanctified, and it's not a one-time thing. Sanctification is a process that lasts us the rest of our lives. So prevenient grace, God loved you before you knew it. Justifying grace, all of a sudden, aha, boom, I know that there's a God and God loves me. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to work with you on sanctification, and help you to grow in knowledge and faith of God. It works within you to become the person that God created you to be to, be, to begin with. Something that in the faith we call the imago dei or the image of God. You know? When God created us, he created us in his image. He wanted us to live in the fullness of that understanding and that relationship. But because of sin, we fell away. Sanctification is the process of bringing us back to that creation that God made us to be in the first place, okay? So that's your lesson on grace for today. We got prevenient grace, then we have justification, then we have... Oh, it's not... Okay, first grace is prevenient. Second grace is... Third grace. There you go. Excellent. See, I've done my job. Amen. All right, um, <laughs> so God's grace, what better definition for understanding a good, good God is there than to understand that grace and why it's there, why it's sufficient for us, and why God has given that to us? So how do we respond? How do we respond to what God has done for us? In the psalm, it talks about David responding to that salvation that he received by God in that moment. He began by claiming himself as a servant of God, recognizing that he was God's servant. That's obedience. So one of our responses to God's love for us is our obedience to God. 
David talked about calling upon God always and calling upon, upon God in the sanctuary. We call that prayer. So we respond with obedience. We respond with prayer, calling on God, recognizing that God is sufficient for us in everything that we go through in our lives. And then third, we keep the promises made to God in the church. How many times do we offer up vows to God in the church? Every time we baptize a child or confirm a child in the church, we as a congregation lift up that we are going to surround them with Christian love, that we're going to live a life of example for them so that when they see us, they know what it is to follow Christ, that we're going to surround them with our prayers and our presence and everything else. That's one of the vows that we lift up and that we make. When we gather in front of the church for a wedding and the vows that are exchanged between husband and wife, think of the things that we lift up and we promise, but sometimes they become just words. Or when we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Those are things that we lift up, but do we always take the time to think about those things? So Part of our response to God's love is to take seriously the faith that God has given us. Take seriously the life that we've been gifted by God and live that out in the best way that we can to live into the vows that we make and let them be real so that through us, others begin to know that love of God. Paul added an interesting thing in his epistle that I think it also is important, not just for us to understand that God is a good, good God, but also how we respond. He talks about the struggles that we end up going through, that life is not always going to be easy, that we are going to have times of trial, we are going to have times of trouble, but they should not worry us. That those are things that help us to become stronger, help us to become better, and help us to persevere. He talks about trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Trouble produces endurance. How many of you can think back over the course of your life and the different trials that you've been through and the different struggles that you've been through and how you have become different because of them? hopefully stronger, hopefully better, hopefully ever able to handle those situations even better when they come up again. So that each time it happens, you get a little bit better about how to deal with and how to handle and how to cope in those different situations. That's the endurance piece. So trouble does produce endurance. Endurance produces character because it shapes you. It makes you stronger. It makes you better able to handle those situations, and because you're better able to handle those situations when they come up, you have hope through them because you realize that there's something beyond those struggles and something beyond those trials. I think the time that came, uh, that came true for me, uh, you know, as we're talking about fathers and everything else, Growing up, and I've shared this in the congregation before, I was an at-risk kid. I got into a lot of trouble. I didn't do well in school. I gave my parents a run for their money. Um, I'm sure it was not easy to be my parent at many times. And at the same time, they didn't necessarily always know how to be present for me through the struggles that I was going through as a teenage kid through losses that I had, you know, my family was always in threes. If we lost one, we lost two more right away. I uh, had one year, lost three very close people to me at a time that I was uh, approaching teenage years and did not know how to cope with that and didn't necessarily have someone to take, take me under their wing and help me in dealing with those situations. So there were many things that went on but there was a divide that formed between me and my parents for whatever reason, and it was just, it was hard. And then I went in the Coast Guard, 
and things started to change for me. I started to have that endurance. I started to learn more and have confidence in myself and ability to do things. I went off to college. I got a degree. I became a teacher. I went on, became a youth leader and Sunday school teacher and everything else and have a wife and children and there was one conversation I had with my parents, and they sat, sat down with me, and they started to apologize because they felt like they had not been the parents that I needed when I was younger. And at that moment, you start to take stock of who you are and what you've been through in your life. And I stopped them, and I said, don't be sorry. I like who I've become. I feel confident in who I am. And either because of how I was brought up or in spite of how I was brought up, I feel like I'm a pretty good person. And for that, I thank you. And I think that's that whole piece, that trouble-producing endurance, endurance-producing character, character-producing hope. My parents did the best that they could. I don't know that I always did the best that I could, but somewhere along the line, things came together. God's grace came in and helped me through difficult times. And again, because of or in spite of whatever they did, I think they did a good job. <laughs> and I'm thankful for the person that I've become both because of them and because of God. Trials took on a new meaning for me over the course of this week as well. As I mentioned, I got a call from one of my former youth letting me know that her father had died. Uh, Jimmy Lehman, who was a friend of mine here, who participated in service here with music and so many other things, uh, and asked me to officiate for her father's uh, funeral. And I had the opportunity to do that and stand with his children as they were saying, saying goodbye to their dad. And then... On Friday, I got a call from my friend Sue, letting me know that her mo mother was in her last moments, and I got to go spend the day with the family. And what a beautiful sight that was. This is a family who's been through this before, that's faced these challenges before, and knew how to face it better than any family that I've known of so far. When we realized that she was in her last moments, Literally, they pulled the hospital bed out, everybody surrounded her, stood there, uh, said last words, hugged and kissed her, uh, shared words with her, shared words of encouragement with one, one another, and just stood around her as she passed. She was not alone. And we joked about and caught a vision of the fact that there were family members that she was looking forward to seeing in heaven and imagining them standing with balloons and stuff like that in, in, in another moment in heaven ready to receive her while we're, we're in the moment of watching her leave from this point. What a beautiful sign and sight and time that was. And then Kate texted me this morning, she had talked to the Replogals and uh, said that Chuck and his whole family got to be there completely around his brother as he passed this morning. What a faithful sign that people have learned from God that love and that grace. They've learned what it means to not only receive it, but how to share it. That even in trials and struggles, they've learned from God how to persevere through them and to continue to love and share that love with others. God is a good, good God. And we learn from that love, we learn from that goodness, and we become better because of it. I ask that you receive that understanding of God's goodness today. I ask that you give thanks for it every day. And I ask that you share it with others so that others will know God's goodness through you. Amen? Amen.